Sir, you're charged with especially aggravated kidnapping. You're also charged with aggravated assault. And you're charged with theft of a firearm worth less than $2,500. You're talking about stuff that is not relevant. Hello and welcome to the Court of Public Opinion. I am the recovery addict, and boy do I have a case for you today. Why is the dog Whoa. chewing on this guy? I think they have got the wrong guy they there. the wrong guy, and the dog was, was biting him. He roughing him up quite a bit. There's a lawsuit. The next search on February 28th, 2020, Okay, it's not working. It's not working the way it was supposed to, which is which is normal for the show. Welcome, you guys. It's uh, it is lunchtime. It is noon, straight up. This is when we promised we would have just an incredible interview for you today, and we will not disappoint. I promise you that part, even if the intro was awful. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I am the recovery addict. Welcome to the Court of Public Opinion. Thank you very much for being here. I appreciate all of you uh, for making your way here today. Um, Here's here's what we have today. We have we've watched for the last nine week weeks. We've watched the uh, taking care of, take care of Maya trial. And it has captured our hearts and our attention. And and as it uh, is, it ended with just a, you know, the fireworks of, of, of a verdict from the jury. Um, it was absolutely incredible, and it left us with a lot of questions about about what happened and why, and and what was what happened behind the scenes that we didn't see. And so today, I have uh, here that are going to join us a couple uh, interesting and very informed people <laughs> that. Um, if I can find where my mouse is so I can bring them on here just one second. Oh, there they are. All right. Oh, I'm trying to work on two computers. So first of all, let me introduce uh, a the uh, the star of the show, uh, Jennifer Anderson. Jennifer is a, a Texas and Florida licensed attorney. Uh, she's practicing in the areas of insurance coverage, commercial litigation, malpractice, insurance, personal injury, and product liability. She's a partner at Anderson Glenn LLP and the wife and attorney of Greg Anderson. Um, and uh, they most recently represented Jack and, and Maya Kowalski in their civil suit against Johns Hopkins Alternative Hospital, resulting in a award of over $211 million in damages, another 50 million in punitive damages. So uh, Jennifer, welcome. Hi. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing well. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm normally using a different computer system so this is driving me nuts it's, <laughs> no worries i don't even know how to use my system so yeah, i don't have my uh, paralegals with me oh you, you you didn't bring your paralegals you should bring <laughs> some paralegals make a quick call make a quick call who, do you, who would you bring if you wanted to if i had any choice it'd be my sisters who are also my paralegals kelly perry and katie goldfield <laughs> the best ever <laughs> well, ask each shall receive. We have today, we have all three of the the Morgan sisters. Is that what it is? Yes. Uh, Jennifer Kelly and Katie uh, to to talk with us today about uh, about the Maya trial. And if you can tell, I'm a little bit flustered. Um, <sighs> deep breath. I just had Mountain Dew. That's what I'm blaming it on. I'm, the oh. DoorDash. The DoorDash. Diet, I mean, right? you're just so excited that we're here. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I am super excited as well. <laughs> Kelly, Katie, and Jennifer, welcome. Um, as Thank we uh, as we get started, I, we would like to just know a little bit uh, for you. What was it like during this trial for you? Watching? How did you watch? How did you participate? Or did you did you uh, watch it all? Was it too much? <laughs> Uh, I guess I'll start um, is I watched because we have two young children. We have a nine year old and a 12 year old. And uh, so we live in the Jacksonville area and uh, Venice is about five, six hour drive away. So I couldn't attend day by day because I have kids to take for, care of. And of course, I thought it would be brilliant this year to homeschool them at the same time as the trial. So um, I was dealing with that. I was able to go down there for about one week while my parents flew down from Idaho to watch my kids. Um, but I started watching um, really through Law and Lumber and then Law and Lumber told me about you at Recovery Addict. And then that's the remainder of the trial of how I participated. And Greg would be texting me in between breaks. And so I was always constantly up to date. Um, but Kelly had a different experience. <laughs> I, I was there for yeah. for some of it um i went out probably like a month or so before trial actually started i also have a family and children so um i had to my rock star of a husband josh took care of the homestead while i was there for 
several months. Um, and then I stayed through, I was in court for the first several days of testimony. Um, and then I got a stomach bug. I know everyone was like wondering what happened to Kelly. Um, <laughs> yeah, I got a stomach bug and the judge was adamant that he didn't want sick people in the courtroom. So I, I took, I took my time, got better. I just checked myself for COVID, make sure I didn't have it. We were good. Um, but, but then something magical happened. We had, I was supposed to be in the hot seat as it's called for, for Greg. And then we had um, Connie Stump with our um, office. She is Nick Whitney's uh, legal assistant paralegal. She stepped in and she rocked it. And it, it was supposed to be a training exercise for her that I was supposed to train her on how to do trials. And she just freaking killed it. So I didn't have to be there anymore. Yay! So I got to stay, stay back at what we called the war house and prep for the following day. And that's, and then I watched it, of course, on YouTube, like everybody else while I was doing my work during the day. And that was my experience. <laughs> that's awesome. Katie, how about you? Uh, mine is not nearly as dramatic. So after the trial was stayed, um, I actually took a different career path and have a different full-time job now. So I was not able to watch any of it live. Unfortunately, I had to watch it in the evening and usually it was a recap by law and lumber. And usually only if Kelly was like, you have to watch today. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I will make sure I hop on. I will look at all the recaps and everything. That was sort of my experience. It's not what I wanted. Had the trial not been stayed originally, I would have also been in the trial house with Kelly helping Greg behind the scenes, but that just ended up not being the path that I was supposed to be on for this trial. So, so what was, what was that like when you say behind the scenes, what was it like for you guys? What, what didn't we see? What was, it was anyone sleeping? Was Total anyone chaos. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have pictures of, we call it the war, the war room and it's just binders and binders along the background. I don't know how many there were Kelly, but um, every morning, I was usually up first, but also Kelly kind of beat me because um, she was always up. I was up at three or four o'clock every single morning doing the recaps and um, getting questions ready and all that kind of stuff that I knew was coming up. And Kelly was doing the actual prep work and then she'd have the team there and then we'd get Greg and Nick ready. And Nick had his own routine. Greg had his own routine because um, everybody, you know, reacts and does things differently. Uh, so it was a, can I go over Greg's routine? Go ahead. <laughs> what? Greg's routine. Here's, here's what it's being like being Greg's paralegal. It's Greg, Greg, focus right here. I really <laughs> need you to know this information. That's Greg's routine with him going, where's my coffee? No, what's I going to do there? <laughs> <That's very laughs> <true. Cats. laughs> so what, uh, what made Greg, uh, or I guess your firm decide to take this? How did, how did you guys find the Kowalskis? How did that, uh, how did it all we, begin? We didn't find them. So what happened was, uh, Deborah Salisbury, who you heard, who was her original attorney in the underlying, um, went through this whole entire experience and then Beata dying. And she said, something needs to be done. So what she did is she contacted an attorney up in Boston that was part of the Pelletier case. Uh, Munchausen's by proxy case up there. And she goes, do you happen to know any Florida attorneys, uh, trial attorneys that are good? Cause she's not a trial attorney. And we happen to have been on a lawsuit with them on another case, a helicopter crash case that we won a $70 million verdict on um, out in Oregon that Kelly was also, and Katie was also a part of. And so he contacted me, sent me an email and I'm used to, I'm a, I'm a kind of a buffer for Greg. Uh, people can't, it's hard to get a hold of him. Let's just put it that way. And so they contact me and I kind of filter through things. And so I read this and I'm like, huh, this is interesting. You know, I've been a guardian ad litem on and off since I was in college, just as a volunteer. And so I read through this. We normally, we don't do med mal. That's not our, that's not our thing. And um, of course the case evolved, but I brought it to Greg. We had a conversation with Deborah Salisbury and then we met the Kowalskis in person down in uh, the Sarasota area at a hotel. And the first time I saw Maya walking down the hall, and she at the time was 12 still, 12, 13, um, uh, my heart broke. And I hugged her and I said, we're taking this. And Greg agreed. So that's how it kind of evolved. Now, you've, you've shared a little bit with me about that. Uh, would, would you care to share a little bit about what, what that meant when you said we're taking this? What did that mean for, for you as a family? Um, 
at, at the very beginning, I had, I, we believed that this would be uh, an easy settlement. And I'll, I, here's here's a backstory. And I know we're going to talk about Howard Hunter and the other attorneys. Howard Hunter and Greg grew up literally around the corner from each other, although Howard's older than Greg by a few years, so they didn't hang out in the same crowd. And uh, so the very first phone call that we made to Howard, Greg's making a connection, or so he thinks, and we're thinking, okay, we'll get some sort of, you know, uh, settlement or, you know, re resolution for this family. And Howard pretended on that phone call, and I'll never forget this or forgive him for this, he pretended like he knew nothing about this case. It's like, oh, tell me about it. And so Greg, you know, the limited that we knew at the time, is telling him about Maya Kowalski and her family. And the entire conversation, he pretended like he didn't know anything about it. So it started from the get-go that he was, um, I'm going to put this nicely, not being fully truthful. Uh, <laughs> now, there, so, were, there were documents that were admitted into court where his name was redacted off of the documents. Um, he was fully involved. He was giving advice. Um, the entire time in the underlying he's the one that was prohibiting he was the one that was making arguments in the underlying dependency action which of course we had to stay away from during trial but advising the court that uh, maya should be sent to another state should not be returned to even her father who wasn't accused of anything or her you know her brother and be sent somewhere else for psychiatric treatment or whatever he was claiming at the time and uh so he's been involved the entire time. Wow. Um, you, you mentioned uh, this, you've got what, five years that went into this to, to bring this to trial to, you know, to where we got to today. Um, there's probably more than the page per day of those five years of documents <laughs> that, that have accrued. Um, you said binders full. How do you handle that much information that much? I mean, is, is there, there's no AI that does this for you, right? No, no. Uh, so how, how it worked is um, I, I create something called this hot docs chronology. I went through and Kelly, I think we uh, compiled, how many documents did I read through? We, our bait summary got up to the 65,000 range. So. Yes. And I you went read through every everything. single one. And then Katie went through all the medical and Katie, how much did you go through? It was a little over 22,000 pages, but to be fair, a lot of that is duplicated because we have multiple copies, but you still have to review all of them to make sure nothing gets missed. So if you total it all up with every version of a medical record we had, it was a, it was like 22,300 pages, I think. So, And I'm just going to take a second and tell you, Katie single-handedly reviewed every single page of the medical records. Single-handedly. I didn't do any medicals. Single-handedly created the chronologies. She gets credit for that one. Oh, yeah. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> and she's the one that found the uh, the fraud also. Um, I had, I guess, the idea about it, you but Katie's the one that, that found it. So we've got a we've got a question here from uh, from Ashley King. She said, uh, "Did he tell Anderson and Whitney what the lawn lumber chat was saying and thinking like how we loved Miss Lawrence?" <laughs> I did. I love Miss um, Lawrence. <laughs> yes, that was that was a very that was an endearing story. Um, I would give Greg as necessary because again, there's so much information input. You can't overstimulate because he's got to prepare for the next day. But if there was something big, I would read the commentaries and I would listen to Rob on Law and Lumber and, you know, things that you pointed out and your listeners. And um, if there was something I'm like, oh, Greg, you need to you need to catch this. I would definitely tell them. I would tell if I needed to tell Nick, I would tell Nick or uh, primarily Greg because we talked every night and said prayers with the kids every night. So. But here's the thing about Greg. You can tell him something. And whether or not he chooses to use that information or pivot in any way is totally up to him. And nine times out of 10, he's already thought of that and yep. thought of like all the different connections to it and has decided it's not worth his time. So, okay. So that uh, initially in this case, I was quite critical of him. And as it, as it moved on, I'm like, hey, this, this man has a plan. <laughs> this man has a plan and it's, and it's brilliant. Oh, um, it was and annoying. <laughs> He's my brother-in-law. I can say it. He's irritating. <laughs> it, it does. It irritates me too. But he does it again. I get the most one-on-one -on -one with him. Um, it's kind of a a technique. Everybody has their own technique as a as a trial attorney. And I don't know if mumbling, uh, kind of pretending, because you know, it is pretending. The guy is brilliant. 
Um, he knows exactly what he's doing, and uh, he once he gets in trial mode, and Kelly can attest to this, Katie too. Mm-hmm. He knows what the facts are, and every it's almost like he was trying to. And you don't want to tell the jury stuff. You don't want to say you must do this because the jury can get turned off by that. So it's almost like if he's kind of little, you know, my papers. They're like, oh, poor Mr. Anderson. Here, we got it for you. We're going to ask the questions. And <laughs> it's a technique. I'm, I'm, I'm hang on. Yeah. Hang on. <laughs> Some of that. Some of that is a is is Greg doing Greg. However, <laughs> the guy is brilliant, but he's also an idiot when it comes to details like numbers. So trying oh, to get yeah. him on track with exhibit numbers is next to impossible. And I know the world oh, watching is that. very frustrated with him. We all were too. So just so you know. <laughs> we, we loved Kelly at the very beginning when you were there. We we absolutely loved you. You had every number, anything you needed. He's like, this is the number. You were you were right there with oh. it. And it, was, it was awesome. We were, we were sad when you got sick. And we're like, oh, man, he's going to need somebody. Uh, let me, you mentioned earlier, uh, you said something about you thought it would be an easy settlement. Did, was that where you thought it was going to go initially and then it ended up going yes. to trial? And then it just kept going and blowing up and they just dug their, their heels in. And then we lost our first judge to pregnancy. We lost our second judge to a conflict that he didn't tell us about that he had. And then we ended up with our, with our third judge, our final judge. So it, and then of course COVID hit, which changed the dynamics and then we were almost going to have trial back in April of last year and defense counsel at the last minute filed an appeal. And at first the second court of appeals, they're like, no, no, no. And then they said, oh yeah, we're going to stay the case. That blew everything out of the water. So it just, and then I think that the defense got really bolstered by all those setbacks for us and kept thinking that we would cave, but that they don't know Greg and I, uh, we don't cave. So when we believe in something. Or so Maya. Strongly. Yeah. Well, it was. Yeah, my, yeah, yeah well, Maya and Jack and Kyle, they were all unanimous and not caving either. They wanted, Maya wanted her story told on behalf of her mother. And Jack and, and Kyle were right there behind her. And yeah. it, it seemed in the verdict when that was read that the, the emotional part for the family was when the, the jury basically said, we recognize what you went through and it was wrong. Uh, it, it wasn't the, yay, we want a huge settlement. It was, it was, we, we hear yeah. you. And, and that was wrong. And that was, that was touching to me to see that I'm um, just, uh, Kyle and, and, and Maya just, you know, hugging each other during that, during that moment and just sobbing as they hear, you know, that yes, that the hospital was found liable with, uh, with Beata, you know, as, as a, as a, one of the reasons that Beata ended up taking her own life. And, and just, uh, that was, that was incredible to see that, you know, the strength they had to have to go through this because, Court isn't easy. I mean, I've been to traffic court, and that was a nightmare. And that was that was one day, right? Yeah. And this is this is five years. I mean, five years plus all the the incidents and all the everything that happened before. Um, just incredible, incredibly strong family. It was uh, really interesting. So my two children that I told you I'm homeschooling, so they were home that day uh, for the verdict, and of course they've been living this for five years with Greg and I, and so they're kind of roaming around in the background, and I said. The verdict's coming up, and my daughter, Lisi, my 12-year-old, she was rubbing my back. She goes, Mom, it's okay. It's okay, because I was kind of a mess. And I'm like, I just need one yes. I just need one yes. And so I think I had the same uh, reaction that you saw with Maya and Kyle. I just heard yes. It wasn't about the money. It was just we're validated, and they're validated. And so I just broke down, and my kids were literally screaming in the background. They were so excited and happy. Again, because they've lived it. And, and Kelly and Katie's kids have lived this too. Yep. So. <laughs> My son came running up the sidewalk, actually, because I was so excited after I found out what the verdict was and his bus was letting out. He's 13. And uh, I remember opening the front door, and which he wasn't expecting because I don't normally greet him at the front door like that because I'm usually working. And I opened the door and he's like, what? And I said, they won. And he, I didn't have to explain it. He just knew. And he came running up my sidewalk and just gave me this giant hug. And he was like, I cannot believe they won. It was awesome. <laughs> that, is, that is really neat. Was there was there ever any doubt in your mind? Was this something that y- you knew that a jury would see? Or I'd lie if I said, no, I had no doubt. No, I definitely <laughs> had it. Yeah, There's always doubt. It's always, a, a, I mean, 
a paralyzing fear sometimes that it's not going to go your way, that someone's not going to, you know, believe your client. And I was just straight up ugly crying during, it was good that I wasn't in court because I could, there was no way I was, <laughs> yeah, crying. I was trying to check off the you form, out. you know, and I was just, <laughs> I mean, it was awful. <laughs> it was awful, well, but I mean, wonderful at the same time. I, I, I I was so grateful. I know um, Connie, the, she was wearing the green jacket that day. She gave up, got up and gave Kyle a hug. And I think it was that moment that everyone was like, I'm so glad. I'm so glad there was a mother in the courtroom to go up and give that boy a hug because I think we all wanted to. So yay, Connie. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. let, let me take you back a little bit. There was a, there was a couple times during this trial where we thought it was going to end in a mistrial. And there was one day in particular where at one point or another, both sides had sort of asked for a mistrial. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure if they'd formally filed it. Was that a bluff? We were both sides sort of trying to feel out the other person? It was a present for us, preservation of the record. Um, but we did not want a mistrial. There's no, no, I don't think any of us could have survived redoing this. Honestly, um, I had a, personally, I had a, a bit of a breakdown after the last trial um, was postponed and um, I, there's just no way I don't, we could, we can't, we couldn't take it anymore. We're just a little, we're a tiny little law firm and, you know, we're a family unit and um, it took a huge toll on us. You know, we have our summer vacations together and, you know, we get together for Christmas when we can. And it was always talking about the trial and strategy and working and, you know, summers, every single summer, you know, Kelly can attest to this. She was over at my house helping me and I'm going through deposition transcripts and, and that was my, you know, that was our summer breaks. And so we couldn't do this again. So I don't, I'm not saying it was a bluff, but um, you have to do what you have to do as an attorney, but do we really want one? No. no. <laughs> yeah. Was there, was there a point in watching this? As, if, I guess, Kelly, you, you were there, you saw the jury as you know, the first day. We didn't get to see that from our, our vantage point. We didn't get to see the jury at all. Was there a point where you thought, I think this is resonating. I mean, I, I know towards the end, we had a court watcher in there who was watching and, and she said, when, when Nick Whitney, you know, he starts talking about Kyle and his voice cracked just a tiny bit. <laughs> and, uh, and then when he gets to the very end and he, he shares that, you know, the analogy with the, the, the movie, the Pixar movie. And, and he, and she said, every single juror was in tears. Yeah. Every single juror. Was there a point before then though, where you thought, I think we've got them. I think, I think they're on board. Not, not early on. Um, I don't, I don't think even up to, I don't even think even up to that moment when they started crying that maybe there was some hope, but honestly, you've seen, we've seen juries that will get emotional for the plaintiff and then still decide for the defense. So that actually, while it's encouraging because you're like, okay, they're, they're emotionally connecting. It's not a guarantee ever, ever. So there's a lot of people that will pick apart like the jury's faces. Oh, they did this. Oh, they took notes during that period. Or, you know, one good indicator is, you know, taking notes during the damages testimony. That's always a pretty good indicator. Yeah. Um, but even then you, you, you've got jurors that don't ever take notes. You know, there was, there was one juror that never took a single note and it was, I was pretty sure that person and, was against us the whole time, but and that one deliberated. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that was a little well, nerve wracking. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, just an audio, you know, an audible person, I guess. But um, but that story, but that Nick told, I, I got to tell the story about Nick. Mm. There was Nick is a Nick's a math major. You know, before he went to law school, he was a mathematics guy. So he's a numbers dude. He's a nerd. Um, but we were doing you know witness interviews in the lead up to trial, and there was one um, witness who did not end up testifying. Um, it was another one of Maya's teachers. And he was interviewing her just over Zoom, you know, just, um, hey, this is how it's going to go. This is, you know, when we need you, that kind of thing. And he, she was, she was recounting some story. And then Nick, Nick got choked up and Jennifer was on the Zoom on the other end. And um, he, he, he's like, I, I need a second. And he got up and left the room. So I, I jump into the Zoom, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I don't know what happened, you know, whatever. We ended the call. And then both Jennifer and I apparently called Nick right after that. We're like, I'm so glad you're not a robot. You have emotions. <laughs> it just was so sweet to see like a softer side of him because he's normally so, he's a military guy, you know, he's pretty, pretty squared away. So. He's got two young children as well. And I think it resonated for him a, a lot. And, uh, 
Yeah. He, that's, and the number thing, that's the another reason why Greg made it a very good decision to put him in charge of all the numbers. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Crazy Cat Queen says, retired Army MD here, worked very closely with JAG, loved the law, and wanted to know how to help with med docs research without JD. Opportunity for FSU, JM, health regulation degree, considering it. Thoughts? I, you're, you're talking above my pay grade a little bit, Crazy, <laughs> crazy Cat Queen. Um, Katie, why don't you tell the story? I think that this will be helpful to how you got into this because of your background in the, in the medical field. Um, yeah, I don't have any sort of special degree in order to review the medical records in cases like this, but I do have some experience in medicine in that for a little while of my life, I was what's called a surgical technician. So I assisted during surgeries. So I had experience in reviewing uh, patient records to begin with, and then also just being part of the operating room. And so um, when I got pregnant with my first child, my sister very graciously said, if you'd like to be able to stay home with him instead of having to take call and work in the OR, um, I would love to have you on my team. We have this case coming up. It happened to be the, I think Jennifer mentioned earlier on, the helicopter case out in Oregon. Um, she's like, I'm going to need someone to review those records for me. It would be great if you could help. So that was kind of how I got into it. I just had some experience. I knew how to read really nasty doctor handwriting, which is impossible to read <laughs> because I had experience with that. And it's just needing the knowledge on what certain abbreviations stand for and understanding the context in which that they're used, things like that. Did he okay. take like a crash course in ICD-9 billing or, or something like that? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. That with those billing records, the Aetna billing records, those were 800 pages long. That was fun to read. And the, the billing codes change frequently, actually. So they get changed year by year. So you actually have to look it up, whether it's ICD-9 or ICD-10, that kind of thing. So you do end up using Google a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Google, the crash course. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Upper Torso says, absolutely wonderful work, everyone. Are there plans for more general legis legislation that will help protect current slash future victims in a similar case to Maya and her family from the system itself? Were you guys aware of anyone who's sort of using this as a, a springboard for maybe some law changes? I know Florida is very friendly to hospitals in the law. Yeah, we, uh, Greg and I have uh, slight connections uh, with Governor DeSantis, and I know his wife um, is in involved in the guardian ad litem program i know they're super busy right now so they probably have not been watching any of this but um uh our goal is eventually some the system's got to be changed um the way they do the privatization of uh companies like suncoast center um one of the things and it didn't come out because there was a settlement with suncoast ahead of time but i got we obtained the the uh, contracts and one of the ways that the payment worked with this private company overseeing this stuff is the more cases of child abuse they get in, the more money they get. The less cases of child abuse, the less money they get. That's got to change because there's an incentive then, and I hate to be callous, but I, again, we've seen it, um, of over-reporting. And I think that's definitely what happened in uh, Pinellas County and in this situation with with Maya, uh, was it was it Sally Smith who testified that it was my job to to look for child abuse to find the, to find the child abuse or something to that effect? She did, and her job is not an investigator. That is not her job. And um, that was one of the points we we tried to bring out. But she tried to make her that she was the investigator. That's not her job. Um, she is just supposed to report. If she if she sees something, look into the situation. But she's not the one that's a prosecutor. Um, the The roles were a little bit blurred in the in the case of Sally Smith. And I'll put put it that way. The other thing with Sally Smith is that we found out. So fifty percent of her work was through Suncoast Center in this in this role, and then fifty percent of it was private practice. And we found out that a lot. I won't say a lot. In certain situations, the kids that went into the system then got referred to her private practice as patients. So she was getting money in two ways from the government. Wow. Yeah, there's there's so much that didn't come out that wasn't allowed. <laughs> she wow. was 
she was unwilling <clears throat> to change her her mind once she made it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a very dangerous perspective to take when you're supposed to be an investigator and in such a huge, hugely, you know, important position. area. What she has, I mean, the way the system works, her word causes, it tears families apart. So, it could. Yeah. And Katie, Katie attended her depositions. Katie, you want to yeah. get the, the I've example had that we talked earlier? Oh, yeah. That, her deposition was actually pretty early on because obviously COVID hit and that sort of changed the entire process for our depositions. They had to go all virtual. So hers were still in person. And I will say that one of the most lasting memories I think I have from this case was from her deposition in which she had basically alluded, I'll use that word, to the fact that maybe Maya was faking um, any of her medical history, whether it be her asthma, her CRPS, whatever it might be, her pain. And during the deposition, Greg pointed out a medical record where she had gone to the hospital for an asthma attack. And the asthma attack was so severe, she was going to be life flighted to John Hopkins, uh, but the weather wouldn't permit that. So they ended up having to do ground transportation. And the medical records showed that she was having sternal retractions, intercostal retractions, subcostal retractions, a lot of the classic signs and symptoms of a severe asthma attack. And again, she was alluding that she didn't believe Maya. And Greg just flat out asked her, he said, you think a 10-year-old knows how to fake subcostal retractions? And she looked him dead in the eye and was like, yes, I do. And I will never forget just that, that response of a why would a 10 year old want to do that and b how would a 10 year old know how to do that i personally sitting there as parent who had no control wanted to say i would like for you to sit here and show me that you can do you know sternal retractions subcostal retractions you show me and now you think a 10 year old can do that and one would, would know to yeah <laughs> yeah it was wow. hard sitting it was hard <laughs> sitting in those depositions <laughs> um Miss Anderson says, uh, Greta K, uh, to you and your whole team, thank you so much for taking care of my and her family. And then it has a gavel. It doesn't show up on there, but they used to gavel. Um, it, was, it was my honor. Let me let me back up. I'm, I'm jumping all over the place, but uh, there were tons of documents. There were tons of um, tons that were admitted and even more, I think, that were not admitted or not used or not needed in the, in the court. Uh, you guys have been uh, kind enough to to provide a couple things with the family's permission that that we've been um, allowed to to share. I got that last night. I put it together in a little video, and I wanted to play it now, if that's all right. Yes. This is uh, just as, as a little uh, little background. This is uh, put to a song that Maya wrote when she was in Johns Hopkins Alternatives Hospital. When she was, um, I don't know what exactly the date, so it's probably during the shelter period. I'm guessing from from the words of the song. Um, but we'll give it a listen here. So on Sunday, I talked Sunday evening, I talked to Dr. Hannah and I said, listen, these people have done nothing for my daughter, nothing. Just the fact that the ketamine is hanging and the Presidex is hanging, that doesn't mean shit because it's not controlling her pain. And that's not what we are here for. If I knew they weren't going to do anything about it, I would not have brought my daughter here. I brought her here to get help. I feel trapped like a prison. I feel stuck inside this place. It's not home and I'm tired, but I'll make it great. I love you too, Bob. You have a good dinner tomorrow with daddy, okay? Okay. I know it's not gonna be homemade, but try to enjoy it. The floors and the people are different in ways. I hate it, but like it in different ways. I feel trapped like a prison. I feel stuck.
are getting sweaty over here. <laughs> got a little hey. sweaty. <laughs> um, first of all, thanks for, for sharing those images that help us uh, get a, a better picture of, of uh, just what an amazing family um, they had um, and, uh, and what an amazing family they are. But uh, tell me a little bit about, about uh, with, with the Kowalskis. It, you, you've made a friend here this this the connection doesn't end now that you know i, I, I mean the court's not over this is going to drag on forever we'll talk about that in a minute <laughs> but uh but what is it like now um what's your connection like with them i'll speak um i guess first i uh, cl very cl very close relationship with maya especially um kind of stepping into the mama bear role a little bit um and just talking to her about things and you know she and greg have a very unique special relationship um but it's different with with women and and girls and so sometimes she'd be like telling you stuff behind the scenes um greg and kyle had had a great connection and i think kelly had a really close connection with jack um i mean all the kids but um jack especially because they talked all the time kelly you can probably well he was he was the i was the main point of contact for him so and i had to pester that man i feel so bad <laughs> over the years of like hey guess what there's another request for photographs what else do you have you know <laughs> the discovery in this case was ridiculous and i think at one point just before trial greg was asking jack at the at the trial house he was asking jack for photos of xyz and jack kind of like blinked <laughs> i went I have every photo ever taken of the Kowalski family. So <laughs> don't ask him for more stuff yet. So over the years, Jack and I, you know, um, just got to know each other. He just is truly with this family. What you see is what you get. He is, I, he's just a very kind man. I, I don't know how else to describe him. He's just a giver, you know? Um, I think he was def definitely the balance to Beata's fiery, you know, personality, if you will. Um, so he, they were, they were a good, a good balance for each other. And uh, it just, it breaks my heart to see some comments online that he didn't, he didn't stand up for his wife. I hate that. I, of course he did. It, it's what you see and the very few snippets that were played in trial, you know, we couldn't counter that with our own stuff because he was there. He could testify to it. So we weren't allowed to, but um, he absolutely stood up for his wife. He did, he, they fought, they fought together um, you know, to try and save their daughter. So to say that he didn't stand up for her just breaks my heart, just breaks my heart. He is a wonderful guy. Um, I wanted to add, sorry, I'm, I'm thinking about that video that you just showed. And I wanted to point out, you guys heard a high pitched like beeping noise in the background. What that was is many of the conversations that were recorded between Beata and Maya took place when Beata was still working. She was a she was an infusion nurse, a tra traveling infusion nurse. So what you're hearing is actually one of her clients' um, IV, you know, alarms or whatever going off. That's actually why the call had to end. She's like, I, I got to take care of you know my clients. So she's still working as an infusion nurse while being unable to even hug her child, which I think is unbelievable. But yeah. that that is that is really neat. What's uh? Can I can I get something from each of you as far as uh, behind the scenes? Maybe maybe a favorite moment, maybe a an insight, the maybe something that you think we would find interesting about the the trial that um, that we probably haven't heard. Jen, do you want to? This is super personal, but yeah. do you want to clear up what happened that day when Greg had to leave court? I think everybody was really curious about. I know it's about super. Mother. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so during the trial, um, Greg's mother died and I received the news, uh, <clears throat> during the day. And so I called several of his friends cause I was conflicted on whether I tell him immediately, should I wait till the end of the day? Should I wait till after trial? So he doesn't, you know, lose focus. And, uh, 
I got one of his best friends said, wait till the end of the trial. He's also a trial attorney. Another friend who said, no, you need to tell him now. And I eventually came to the conclusion, wait till the end of the day, but he needs to know. Cause I think he would really hate it if I waited till the end of the trial and told him. Um, so, uh, I, I guess he went in the next day and something was said. And you, that's why you emailed the JA, didn't you? I did. I knew Greg wouldn't say anything because Greg just soldiers on. So I emailed the uh, judicial assistant to the to the judge and um, and let her know. I said Greg's not going to say anything, but in case you see him a little um, unusual, his mother passed away the day before, and so the JA passed it on to the judge. And so something was said, and yeah, so that was a that was a that was a big moment. From from our perspective, we saw we saw the judge call the the counsel from both sides up, Mr. Hunter and and Greg, and the judge um, handed a note to to Greg, and and we saw Greg's head go down, and Mr. Hunter reached over and, and put his hand on his shoulder, and um, you could tell Greg was emotional in that moment, yeah. <laughs> and the judge uh, directed the cameras to turn off, but before he did that, um, and you can verify this, what what it looked like to me is he said, "Stay right here, don't don't go back." Um, let's turn the cameras off and give you, you know, some some privacy. And so he directed the cameras to to go off screen with with well, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hunter went down, sat down. And Greg stayed up at the bench until the cameras were off the off of him. So yeah, it was we we knew something was wrong. Um, and yeah, it had been terrible. But <coughs> wow. uh, on a lighter note, can I? Since yeah, you Katie, asked, Katie. <laughs> um, it's still about Greg, mm -hmm. actually. But um, I think. One of the things that sticks with me throughout the trial uh, also started kind of when I was in Florida for that first deposition of Sally Smith and Greg and I had gotten together, obviously, to talk about the plan for the next day, what we were going to cover. And Maya called him um, and he, I think, was on the phone with her for a little over an hour. And it was really just about, try not to cry, encouraging her and uh, trying to give her strength to get through what he knew was going to be sort of a painful and lengthy process for her. And that was not the only time that I saw him do that with her. Over the course of the years, I had a number of interactions with Greg, where, whether we were on vacation together over the summer or if it was a Christmas vacation together, you know, because we don't live in the same state. So it was whenever we'd get together. There were multiple times where I did see Greg get on the phone with Maya and just give her the emotional support that I think that she and her family needed to kind of get through this whole thing. And that will always stick with me. He genuinely cares about Maya and her family. Let me, let me dig on that just a little bit. Um, the hospital fought hard in this case, and I'd say they, they sort of fought dirty as well. Um, you've got, how do you prep a couple of kids, uh, you know, Kyle, Maya, and and a, a grieving dad for, for what they're going to face in, you know, being in a deposition or a cross-examination? How do you, how do you tell them, I mean, do you just say, hey, it's going to be ugly, or do you go over it with them, and do you, do you role play a little bit? I mean, what, how does that go down you, well i mean obviously we definitely prepped them for the basics um i guess this is another side backstory the maya went through five depositions kelly i think yeah five. was it uh, five? Oh wow or maybe it was four uh anyways the the first yeah because she did two anyways the first couple were with um david hughes and we could not prep her enough for david hughes because Without being disparaging, let's just say he doesn't have the best uh, um, emotional gauge. Um, and she stormed off the, these depots crying. Um, he is the one that led to her um, one of her relapses where she ended up in the hospital uh, with a feeding tube down her nose for five, five days or so. Yeah. Um, so we switched over to, to Ethan Shapiro. So you can only... You can only prep them so much, but it depends on the attorney that's taking the deposition because each had a different style. You know, Howard had one, David had his own, Ethan, you got to know him, you, you know, Mr. Low Voice, um, but calmer. And she liked, you know, dealing with him much better because at least it wasn't aggressive. Um, so you can only just say, this is what we anticipate, but they knew the truth. They knew the story. So we would, we always just basically said, these are some topics they might talk to you about, but you just tell your story and because they're not liars and 
And you can see Maya, especially extremely eloquent um, and great speaker. Um, and, and poor, poor Kyle, you know, everyone kind of leaves him out of the mix. I, I just wanted to hug that kid all the time because um, he's very internal. Um, but he had the support. And again, he got along really well with Greg, you know, kind of the, the manly thing. But I don't know, Kelly, Katie, do you have anything? I, I, I think it's easy for them. Maya is just just an amazing person. You know, I, I told her she needs to go into advocacy for, for her career because she's just a natural. Um, and she is, again, all I can say is what you see is what you get. She really is that brilliant, that sweet, that unassuming. She really is. Um, and there was no, it, it's what I always, here's what I always tell witnesses when I'm talking to witnesses. I'm like, all you have to do is get up there and tell the truth. If you tell the truth, we're not going to have any problems, yeah. whatever that might be, you know? So for these kids and for Jack, it's just a matter of their, their story never changed. It was consistent all the time. You know, they, the defense tried everything they could to trip them up or get them to, you know, change their opinion on something or, you know, I think playing dirty sometimes putting pictures up that were, you know, of a seven oh. having fun. I know, I know, but that's what, okay. <laughs> here's one behind the scenes. It, it didn't come out in trial, but David Hughes, I think on the last depot he took of her, I guess she was out at the beach with a cousin of hers and she was wearing a bikini, I don't know, whatever, you know, kids wear. And he put the, the photo of her with her cousin on the screen in her little bathing suit for, I don't know how, it was like up to five minutes. I'm like, get off the photo of this little girl and start asking your questions. It was, that made me angry and yeah yeah we're all a little protective of yeah <laughs> of this family <laughs> they mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah i they just told the truth and thank thank god the world the world heard it and the jury heard it and you know i know a lot of credit goes to that that film they made but um they from the get-go wanted beata's story to be heard mm -hmm. and wanted beata's truth to be told the fact that, you know, she, she was just a mom fighting for her kid and fighting for answers. And she fought, you know, unfortunately for her, it, it was up against the wrong people who had power over her. So um, that's all they did. Kelly, you mentioned the, the documentary, the Netflix documentary. Um, obviously, a lot of people watch that. But did you ever expect that this trial would, would gather the attention that it did, the trial itself? Um, once the movie came out, I think... It was sort of obvious it was gonna it was gonna go this direction. People, I mean, it's captivating. It's a really interesting story, um, and it's tragic, and it's got you know so many facets to it. You know, you've got um, obviously with Beata, you know, her unaliving herself. That's that aspect. People can relate to that. You know, people have experienced that. You've got the chronic pain issue. So many people ha can relate to that. I can't even tell you the number of families that I spoke to over the years who have dealt with this, whose story is exactly the same, you know, accused parents, you know, chronically ill child, um, dealing with an unsolvable mystery of an illness. It's, it's consistent throughout. It just resonates with people. So once that, once the movie came out, it sort of became inevitable that it would, it would turn into something, which is terrifying, but <laughs> It's a little surreal sometimes. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, what? I mean, who me? <laughs> yeah. There were there were a couple things uh, during the trial that that came out that uh, that we heard a little bit about, and then they never materialized. Um, like mm. the original, oh, yeah. the original IJ, which I guess they never provided. Right? It, is that is that they just know, got away? Did we with? ever get the original IJ? I don't. I have never seen it. I don't know if we have it. Yeah, I I, I've never you, seen it either. I can I never tell you if we did that whole incident of that bombshell day is baffling to me. They have, yeah, it's just baffling how that all unfolded. I, well, I don't know how they let that happen. Hunter buried that Dracula a long time ago. Uh, yeah. so. <laughs> That's probably one of the key lines of the trial. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if we can go into this one. Uh, Shapiro's wife's Facebook posts. We, uh, we heard a little bit about that. Is that, is that like, you can shake your head and say go on next if we need to but 
What? what? I, I didn't follow that. That would be Kelly, I think. No, I don't know. Something. Okay. We'll skip okay. that one. We'll skip okay. that one. <laughs> well, let's see. We have uh, got a couple comments here uh, from Chapter says, Thank you for fighting for what's right. I've been following from Scotland. You're all amazing. And we'll be following your progress. Chris. Thank you. Um, Larry, Larry Lini says, It was so poignant that they won the day before Polish Independence Day that celebrates their independence and the fall yeah. of communism. Yeah. I think I've missed about a million comments here. I'm trying to find, <laughs> trying to find them all. Um, let's see. Oh, I uh, need to point out something before I forget. Yeah. Please. So I guess you were talking about Dan Reyes, and he did a phenomenal job. I'm not taking anything away from him. Um, but those two slides at the very end of the closing, Kelly, um, <laughs> Kelly did those on the fly. It was not Dan Reyes. That was Kelly, and she did it. And send it over. Did Dan get person. credit for my work? <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> that was not Dan. That was Kelly. <laughs> so Dan, Dan's the man with the uh, the Alienware laptop. Yes. Right. Which featured prominently. I, I noticed it, it changed colors. It has little LED rings, and it changed colors. And the last day of court, it matched his tie. Was that was that intentional? Does he color coordinate his laptop with his tie? It was probably funny. was. <laughs> That was really cool. We we uh we love that laptop. It was I, I'm not sure if Alienware sort of gives him a kickback or something, get him a new laptop or something for Ray. Everyone's like, hey, that's a good laptop. He never had he never had like laptop problems. The other side, they had to reboot their computer times. So like, that's because you don't have an Alienware. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, yeah. I know he went over to help them a lot and was like, stop helping them, but you know, <laughs> it's the right thing to do. <laughs> Running technology during a trial on the fly, though, is not easy. Kelly, I think, probably has more experience with that than anyone else. Yeah. She had to handle that for that last big trial we did. It's no easy feat. There you was no that. way I was going to do that on this trial. No way. <laughs> so when when Greg and I were talking about whether I was going to attend or not, because um, it was in question there for a while, I told them, I'm like, I I'll go, I'll go on one condition, you hire an outside firm to do it. And that was when Dan Reyes <laughs> came into the rescue. So <laughs> thank you, Trilogy Trial Consultants. <laughs> awesome. he, did, he did a great job. Um, let me uh, let me go back to the verdict a little bit. What what do you guys think the, uh, the 50 million in punitive, what do you think the jury is, what message are they sending with that? I think they did a perfect job on that because it was enough to send a message, which is what you do with punitives, but it wasn't over the top which is very helpful on, on appeal because an appellate court can be like, well, they had over a billion dollars available to them. They did a relatively small amount of 50 million. They've got the assets in cash. So it was just enough. They, they heard the message to send a message. And that's what the, I felt the 50 million was spot on perfect. You know, not shooting for the moon because that would have created so many more problems. That's my opinion. All right. So, uh, and now jumping to another question from chat. This is from uh, Adam Nusky. I can, I'm not sure if I can pull it up, but it, he says, uh, can you uh, ask about the jury questions? What What do you think the first time the jury questions came out and you saw how much personality they contained? What What was your thought when, when that happened? I've never seen personal like questions that have so much flair and, and interesting uh, phraseology, I guess I'll say. I don't know, Kelly, which one was the funny, the, the one that kept kind of bringing levity to it, like into the, was it, I don't know which juror it was, but I, I did kind of like the flair. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, because um, I don't know if the jurors have come out to talk yet, so I don't know who's who. Oh, okay. um, but I do know my thought was they're paying attention, you know, yeah. the fact that they were so insightful. And I love the personality, you know, I'm... <laughs> I'm, you know, kind of a wallflower myself, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I love, I love a good personality. I love when people actually make it a human experience and not just a dry, you know, it made it a lot more fun, I think, to, to, to be a part of this. So Greg and I were also the same thing we talked about. We loved the juror questions because it, again, it showed that they were invested yeah. in this. Oh, um, big time. Yeah. I think, I think we have a couple, at least uh, one of the jurors watching right now. <laughs> so, oh, oh so <laughs> welcome, oh. welcome, juror number one. Um, <laughs> let me. Uh, some people are asking this question. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with the no. civil suit, um, it's not over. I mean, no. It would be nice if, if you know, the judge bangs the gavel and, and the check gets written, and and everyone uh, 
up, leave, uh, levels up right then. What what is the process now going forward? I mean, how how long till the the family can can see some of you know the the damages that they've you know, been awarded? It it's all dependent on what defense counsel does. Um, if they decide to uh, come to the table and actually talk a real settlement with us, which I can't go into what they did before, um, but if they decide they're going to still say we were right and you guys are wrong, which I'll, I'll just tell you, I've been reading some comments by certain opposing council members on the defense team and they're calling the jurors um, people from a bus stop. What do you expect people from a bus stop to, to, wow. to do? Yes. I just read that this morning. And so I don't know what their plan is unfortunately so it could take years um so oh, there's no it's like oh you're gonna go on a big vacation and no we still have a law firm to run we still have you know people we have to pay and you know payroll and all that kind of stuff because it's on you know the partners um but mostly greg and i and um so we just have to keep doing our day-to-day -day lives and uh and so so is the kowalski family this isn't you know let's go to disney next week <laughs> you <Yeah>. know <laughs> yeah. Um, there was, uh, you, you mentioned that moment, uh, where they just don't get it. Uh, Mr. Shapiro in his closing, his opening line to the, to the jury basically was, well, you guys, you got it wrong. I don't know why you're angry and why, why you messed yeah. up, but now let me, let me win you over to my side. Um, talk about not being able to read the room. Uh, yes. I was, I was astounded by, by his, his approach there. That one um, floored me. <laughs> yeah. The, uh. I, I, I tease this question. You guys know I was going to ask it and I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, for each of you, if you had to choose a favorite on the <laughs> team, <laughs> who and why would be your, your, your favorite uh, player on the defense team? Favorite's a funny term. Um, I think the, the best one for the defense team was actually uh, Curls. Um, she came in late in the game. Um, but she, besides her gesturing and looking over, which really annoyed me, um, she was very sharp. Um, she and Kelly actually had a lot of interactions. She was doing a lot of paralegal work with Kelly, which is, I found kind of funny. Um, and uh, Alton Byrne was also always a professional, um, except the, near the end, he got a little angry at the judge. But uh, those are my two. Uh, definitely not Hughes and thousand percent not hunter um I've, I've gotten in a lot of fights with hunter i had he another associate i know you guys saw it on tv um, um with uh samantha lawrence uh he kind of you know turned on her was kind of being mean to her but he did that to another uh young associate of ours and i had to get on the phone with him and i put him on a five second timeout. i said before because <laughs> we had to do meet and confers the judge ordered it and i said before mr hunter you respond to whatever was said, take five seconds, think about it, then respond. And I, I treated him like he was acting, which was a child. Um, cause it was, it was not good. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of my order. <laughs> I've had a couple interactions with both David Hughes and Howard Hunter where they've written some unprofessional emails and, um, you know, for both of them, I'd be like, this is completely unnecessary. You know, why, what is the point of doing that? Um, to his credit, Hunter actually did write and he stopped short of actually apologizing, but he did acknowledge that it was, you know, not directed at me or I got in the line of fire or whatever he said. But um, I would have to say Pat is probably the the one I, I can't use the word favorite, but she was at least um, diligent. Yes, she was very diligent. Um, she <laughs> she and I got into a discussion shall we say about uh, the word lesion, you know, cause at the end there, there's a list of exhibits that goes back to the jury and you have to offer a description. So there was a lot of discussion about how to describe certain things. And some of the photos of Maya's lesions, I wanted to call them lesions. That's what they are. And she was, she, I didn't call them CRPS lesions, just lesions. And she disagreed with me. I'm like, Pat, what would you call those? What are those? <laughs> but a mark? Like, what is that? A wound? <laughs> so, <laughs> Katie, do you have a, uh... Um, I actually only had interactions with David Hughes and Howard Hunter and I, Oh, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say, I, 
I can't. <laughs> I will say David, I, David Hughes is probably the least popular, I would have to say. Um, you know, I I I, <laughs> I can't I can't say this in front of everybody who's watching, but I will say I have a um a visceral reaction to Mr. Hughes. I, I can't listen to his voice anymore. No. It makes me ill. Okay, yes. I apologize for that question. <laughs> <laughs> um somebody uh somebody asked a question here that I was trying to that now I've forgotten. Um here, here it is from uh, from Mathis Greece. Uh, how do Nick and Greg split witnesses? How was that decided? Who's like who, who takes? Uh, was Greg was the ultimate decider on on everything. Um, but he would pick out witnesses that he knew he would have weaknesses on. That'd be like the damages, uh, anything with numbers, technical stuff um, that he would have to, you know, uh, statutory things. So that's how they would split it up. Greg was more on the the emotional side of witnesses, and that's kind of how that's kind of how it got split. And and poor Nick, I feel, but give him credit. Like Kelly said, sometimes Greg can wait to the last minute, and you don't know what his plan is. And so I think Nick said something about one of the final, I think it was a numbers witness, or he's like, "Yeah, I found out ten hours ago. I'm doing this," you know. But uh, so. It would be, you know, that kind of decision making on on how Greg was feeling with with prep and and I kept telling Greg because I'm like, you can't do everything because I think he made the mistake a little bit early on of not giving Nick more. But again, because Nick's our partner, but he's also young at trials, not anymore. But um, so Greg was being kind of a little bit uh, o overtaking a little bit too much. And I, t I kept telling Greg and saying, you got, you can't do everything. You got to let some of this go. And uh, eventually he listened to my advice. And that's when he started seeing Nick pop up more and more near the end. I will say that there were times the night before um, when we would have a, an especially stacked day the next day that it just came down to a matter of necessity. Greg physically could not prep for, you know, five different witnesses. So it just became a matter of um, necessity that he had to finally rely on Nick a little bit more, but, um, you know, Nick is just that brilliant though. Um, yeah. I don't want to pump him up too much cause he's probably, yeah, gonna his head's <laughs> getting really big. <laughs> he's already got a don't tell him I said that. <laughs> I take it back. I take it back. No, he's That'd just our back. little secret. Yeah. <laughs> Well, no, he's a wonderful man. I, yeah, I love they were, he's a great yeah. guy. The whole great team, guy. the whole team is amazing. Yeah. Both Greg and Nick, uh, absolutely can be devastating on cross and, and oh. watching them watching them focus in and, and lead someone uh you know not lead them you know like in the legal term but uh guide them to their to their answer and and you know spring the trap has was just it was brilliant to watch it was absolutely yeah. wonderful to you, you you almost want to cheer you know they <laughs> did the applause <laughs> and everything it's like uh oh i have a little sound effect that or that uh, it's from star wars oh, someone's in my house Don't know who <laughs> um it's uh, a cockroach <laughs> yeah, big, big one just came in the back door. Um, but it's, it's the Star Wars, it's a trap, you know, type of thing. You know, sometimes the witnesses just couldn't tell that, yeah. that there was something they were going after. And uh, it, it, what what would you say their favorite part of being a lawyer is? Is it, is it that cross or is it the... Greg? 100%, oh, definitely. 100% with Greg. Um, that's, that's, Greg is so strong on being able to think on his feet that a lot of attorneys can't do because a lot of attorneys think like most people think, which is, you know, A, B, C, D. Greg doesn't think that way. Greg thinks in like, I don't know, a starburst or something. <laughs> yes. He goes way outside the lines, but A, X, nine, seven, two, three, four, B. He, he can, he can, pick up on things that someone says and, and turn around and um, have a line of questions ready. And he can just, do it instantaneously, and that is just you can't teach that. That is just natural. Learning to pivot is the is the biggest thing for trial lawyers. And Greg has done a lot of mentoring with Nick. And again, Nick picked it up so yeah. fast because he's brilliant. Um, so Nick, in his own way, in his own technique, um, same thing. I think he kind of. I think he. I think they both really like. I, I don't know, Kelly. Do you think Nick also with the cross? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Nick was Nick was um, more the the type of um, attorney I think that people can relate to because he would lay it out. Yeah. Here it is. 
there's the trap. Greg, sometimes I get, think it's, you know, really excited about something. Um, he, he's almost better when he's unprepared, to be honest. Um, yeah. when, he, when he prepares, <laughs> it starts to get, he gets so excited and he gets to like to the end and you're like, oh, almost Greg, almost. <laughs> yeah, that was his um, biggest disappointment was um, his uh, questioning of Beatty. Um, he prepared all weekend and too I much. think he just, he prepared too much. And um, that was probably his biggest disappointment because that's the one, you know, we really wanted to bring it to her and um, not saying it was bad, but that was not his best work. Well, she took care of it herself. So yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> Thankfully. Um, let's see. We've got one. Uh, Katie, this is for you. You've been, you've been a little oh. quiet. So we're going to start with you and work oh, our great. way back. <laughs> um, who was your favorite witness? Oh, you see, favorite always comes out as such an odd question, um, just because I'm not really sure the intention behind the word favorite. I think I I feel like I'm creating dead air for you because I can't come up with an answer. Um, I'll fill mine in. Yeah, fill yours in while you give me a second to think on that, and maybe it'll help guide me on favorite. I mean, the obvious is Maya, but um, the uh, Mr. Goodhair. Dr. Cochran. Yes. <laughs> the best. Yes. <laughs> no. He made me. Uh, he, he was good. He was Dr. very Corcoran, good. He's, uh, I'm hoping to have him on the show tomorrow. That's, okay. We've, you'll, we've, you'll been, enjoy we've been talking him. back and forth. Um, he, correct me if I'm wrong. He's, he's not an expert witness. This is not no. what he does, right? No, it was a friend, time. friend of a friend. Um, kind of situation. We didn't know him at all, um, but he was a friend of a friend, and they had dinner, and he became interested, and and um, said, "I'll do this for free." And we're like, "Okay, even better." Um, you know, so he came I in asked him. He felt passionate. Go ahead. Tell I him. asked him at one point, like, "You're you're an expert witness, and you're doing this for free." And he said, "He goes, I just want to help." He said, I, you know, I look, he's such a systems guy. He's like, I look at this and I see that the system there, it was broken. He's like, and I just want to help fix it. And I'm like, that, could you have a purer motive? Come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> good hair, good motives. <laughs> okay, so he, he did a great job on testimony. He was, yeah. his, his answers, uh, I loved when, when he was first up on the, Sorry, my alarm is going off. Um, when he was first up uh, on the stand and he's introducing himself, he's he's, he's telling us about, you know, the, the the boat craft, the Cushcraft boats, and he's telling us about his wife's restaurant. And I'm like, I love this guy. Yes. This guy <laughs> I can connect to. I mean, I don't connect when somebody tells me just how many law degrees they're, sorry, yeah. you know, how many degrees they've got, how many, um, you know, how many schools they've been to and all the, all the letters behind their name. And, and he wasn't, it was just like, yeah, this is me. I'm, and I connected to him right then. And, and then you know, knowing that this was his first time testifying as an expert witness uh, on cross, he was unbelievable. Yeah. It, it was, it was almost like, uh, I think it was Hunter that crossed him, right? Yes. Yeah. And Hunter should have just sat down. It was yes. worse for them. <laughs> It was worse for him getting up and crossing him than, than if he had just sat down and said no questions. Yep. Uh, it was just, and, and you, to get that sort of performance out of somebody for the first time, he's got to keep doing this. Yeah. <laughs> he was born for this. And I'll, I'll give him a hard time about that and, and when we get him on the show later. This week. Katie, is, did you come up with an answer? Um, it's going to feel like a cop out, but it's really not. It's to Jennifer's point. I think it probably is Maya um, mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons. I, have never considered myself to be someone who is brave. And I feel like getting up on that witness stand and having to tell her story like that in front of that courtroom was one of the most brave things I've ever witnessed. And I think one of my other favorite parts about her was a little bit of her personality getting to shine through when she got mad at Greg about not getting to answer questions. Oh, off the phone yes. <laughs> yes. I think, I think that's probably, I think that's probably why she's my favorite. <laughs> All right. Um, what happens now in the trial? What's the, what's the next step? Uh, now we've got to do the the post trial um, motions and forms and all that kind of stuff. And we're trying to do it as rapidly as possible because we want to get this to the appellate stage as fast as possible. The other part I'm sure you heard um, is Maya having told us during this trial um, about this sexual. I don't know how to put it, but situation that occurred um, and, and turning that in. And so we're 
preparing our complaint um, because the judge, and I think he rightly, I think it was a good decision on his part because it would have set us back, um, not allowing that in during mid trial, but um, getting that going because there's no statute of limitations. Um, so we've got the criminal complaint filed and then it's going to be hopefully trying to figure out who this guy was sicko was that did that. Cause there's no, she didn't, there was no medical purpose for this person. Assuming he's a doctor, pretend doctor. I don't know how he got in there, but um, coming in and looking at her private parts, it, what well, it just, it's disgusting. So, and the fact that uh, Katzenstein Kelly or Katie didn't Katzenstein note something like she, so we have during the time, Dr. Katzenstein noting something about it. And then of course, Maya telling a, a guy friend a couple of years later about it. So it wasn't like this is just something that was made up during trial. This is something that's been pervasive from the get go. Um, but Maya just kind of kept it because she was embarrassed and you don't know things as a 10 year old. You just know it's kind of icky and bad, but yeah. you don't. And again, you don't have your family around to say, hey, this guy came in and did this to me. And she didn't have her mother to tell right. her that's not yeah. normal. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. so that, that's going uh, to come in. Yeah. Sorry, I see a question I want to answer. Which one is it? It's fun and funky asking, what did the ladies think about jazz hands? Oh, all right. <laughs> all right. So I, I, I got to say, across, I mean, throughout this trial, they've had the same paralegals as well. Um, and I'm, I, I'll just use their first names, Tracy and Amy. They've been wonderful. I'm going to go ahead and go to bat for them and say that they have been very professional. Um, I think paralegal, paralegal, we kind of, we get it. It's, we work for difficult people sometimes and on difficult cases, but we, we work together to get the job done. So the jazz hands moment, oof, I think that was a, um, I think I, I'm going to just assume the best of the situation and assume it did not have to do with what was happening in court. That oh, might have been a private conversation, just knowing what I know about the character of Tracy and Amy, knowing what I know, I, I personally find it very hard to believe that they would have been so obvious as a, in a reaction, but yeah. that's my It was point. very regrettable. Let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think it was uh, quickly regretted. Because, <laughs> yeah. because especially after they, they it was short-lived <laughs> but i don't know what, i give them the benefit of the doubt i mean was there was there a, a certain there was a lot of body language on display during this trial uh especially on the defense side tons of body language yeah um well we have dr g who does dr g explains he's a clinical psychologist and a, a forensic psychologist he, he breaks that down for us a lot of times we'll, we'll see if we can get with him on that but was there a moment when when you were watching uh, the other side, whether it was, uh, there was a time when, when all the defense team had something really important to scribble on and look away and there, nobody could, could keep their eyes up. There was just, it was, it was hilarious. I'm trying to remember what brought that about. Um, was there a time that we were, you like, uh, wow, <laughs> look at, look at, look over they, there. They, they have no poker faces. Um, mm -hmm. oh. let's just put it that way. One, one of the very first, um, trial, I've been a lawyer for 21 years now. Um, but one of the very first lessons I learned from one of my, my mentors when I was young, um, I was, I think it was, I was in a bench trial and I was like, you know, I was doing the same thing, you know, gesturing and he pulled me aside and he said, no, he goes, you got it. You got to keep the game face and you can't, you can't do that. And nobody, I guess, has explained that to defense counsel ever in their career. Although I think one thing I'll give David Hughes credit for, he kept a poker face, oddly yeah. enough. Um, he was just, you don't think so, Kel? Oh, I do. Well, I mean, it was a face. I don't know if it was a poker well, face. <laughs> <laughs> he had a face that he kept the same. But, um, yeah. but the rest of them, the hands, the, you know, Howard Hunter mm -hmm. all the time with his, like this. I'm like, don't, do you know what you're, you're emoting <laughs> out here? But. And Pat always looking dumbfounded by anything. Yeah. <laughs> always. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it looked like uh, in, in soccer when somebody flops, you know. Yes. Bumps them. It, it's the <laughs> yeah. over, 
they're, they're <laughs> over dramatic. Oh, did you see what just happened? You know, type <laughs> thing in the rest. Oh, that moment early on when we were going to call, I think it was Dr. Hannah, and then we changed our mind at the last minute, and there was so much discussion in the courtroom about like, oh, I can't, they were throwing papers up in the air and come on, do you know how much that happens in trial that you're, <laughs> you're going to call a witness and then you don't at the ma I mean, come on. <laughs> that was, that was a little over the top. I thought it almost seemed like, uh, like both sides were trying to just rib the other people by just, you know, that, that's sort of the game gamesmanship of, of trial, right? Sometimes you, you're like, hey, but here's the thing on the table until the last minute and then might not go with it. I will tell you 100% that is not something that we do. We really don't. It is, it was, it was just a last minute decision because of timing and different witnesses and different issues going on behind the scenes that he couldn't come. So I will tell you 100%, we don't, we do good. not play that way. So, no. a, so you mentioned timing, time became a factor, uh, yeah. unfortunately, earlier on in this trial, um, were yeah. you nervous? Were you worried before the judge uh, gave I up? honestly, I, I could not imagine. I had many discussions with Greg about this because I've never been on a, a timer clock like this before. I, I get it. And the judge did a great job of moving this along. And I get that point. But I could not imagine a scenario where the judge would actually say, oh, you ran out of time. You can't cross one of their witnesses. They could just do and say whatever they want to. I couldn't imagine that ever happening. But because like Kelly just explained, we don't play those games. We knew what the judge's intent was. We got the extra couple hours. We did what he wanted and we moved it along. And, um, but I'm just going to go ahead and go back to, uh, there's no reigning in Greg. You can yep. tell him all day long, Greg, you've got to, you've got to get to the point faster. Yeah. Yeah. Greg's so going to Greg. Whose job is it to hand in the post-it note that says, wrap it up, wrap it up. <laughs> I think Nick, I think I saw Nick do that once. I think, and Greg's like, oh yeah, I, I gotta, I gotta finish this yeah. up. I'm like, I think, so it's, all of us do that when we're kind of behind the scenes. Um, but like Kelly said, you know, I've been married to the guy for almost 15 years and I've learned if he needs to tell a story, I just gotta let him. And yeah. I just sit there and I'm like, I'll do a crossword puzzle while he finishes, you know, whatever he's <laughs> trying to tell me. <laughs> Barbara Farthing says, recovery addict, was that whole joint commission thing all pre-planned? I mean, how the door got opened. Was that something you always wanted, were seeking a way to, to get in? Or was, did that sort of... It, it was kind of shocking yeah. to us. I don't know if Kelly knows more behind the scenes, but I was shocked by them opening the door. I thought that was yeah. a, the dumbest move, one of the dumbest moves that Shapira made. Um, because, of course, we were... You, we can we can, we were allowed to gloss around certain things, but the judge had made certain rulings. But once they opened the door, it's a no holds bar, you know. So, but Kelly might know a little bit more behind the scenes. I I don't know the when it started when we first found out that there was an issue out there. Obviously, um, Corcoran knew about it, um, right? You know, but it was pretty late in the game, I want to say. But at one point, I. I I mean, our exhibit list, let me tell you, my first copy of it was like 100 pages long. So trying to remember all of them. But I'm pretty sure that like the CMS survey that we had was on there. So for them to be in any way surprised that we knew about it, that's why the whole thing is very baffling to me that they it was not a shock to any any of the players that this was out there. I could not believe that they opened that door. I was could it? not believe it. Was it a, a, did he sort of bait them to open the door? Was there, there's, there's some discussion. I think Rob, um, Rob and law laying the, the breadcrumbs. Yeah. Laying yeah. The breadcrumbs to sort of lead them to make them want to bring something out. And they, they sort of stepped in the trap themselves. <laughs> or did I, I think, I think yes. there probably were some breadcrumbs laid. We didn't know that they would actually do it themselves. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they were the mouse that, you know, bit the cheese on the little trap. Um, not, but we never thought we never thought that this would come out, and it did. you hope it would, you know. Yeah, hope it. But. Something that I think everyone should know about, but um, certainly not anything we could do ourselves. So thank you, thank you for yeah. that. <laughs> um, uh, this question came up. Uh, did you see the wink? Yes. Was that was that just a nervous witness? That Which I guy was that? Yeah. That was um, their internal, the new, the guy that only worked there one year, I cannot remember his name. He's kind of really pulley. Um, 
I can't remember. Oh, his the name. codes guy, the billing guy. Yeah, the billing guy. Banker. Okay. Yeah, that was very bizarre. I don't know. He, I, I I chalk it up to probably him, him being nervous and maybe thought he was being cute with the jury. They they probably prepped him like you know make sure there were several witnesses that they put on. You can tell they were so over prepped and you know the the fake little smile Kyle. and I know <laughs> like the the nurse with the long brown hair. Again, I'm forgetting all the names. The one with the glass. She her little weird deadpan face and then oh. Yeah, her. her the nurse, the one that Maya supposedly liked a lot. Ashley. Yeah. Ashley. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she so was... I think that was just nerves. I think it was nerves for her, too, um, and being overly prepared. I'm yeah. um, being told, connect with the jury. You know, <laughs> there's a way to, to do that. <laughs> Snazzy Trinkets Jewelry says, it seemed to me that defense at times was trying to get a mistrail. 100%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That, that they did not want the thing to go to trial. They would have loved another postponement. And um, again, I think I give kudos to the judge on really helping avoid those situations and limiting what I, I, I don't know what, I know they're going to do whatever they're going to do on their appeal, but I don't think they have any real issues because this judge did such a phenomenal job on preserving the record for appeal. Yeah. And I know we've uh, we've made Katie overstay her lunch. Uh, oh like, yeah, sorry, Katie. <laughs> That's okay. I didn't want to cut anybody off. I want you to get fired. Yeah. Katie, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I was going to stay for just a minute longer, um, but uh, but if you need to drop that, I, I perfectly understand. Did um, you have anything else that you wanted to ask me and waste more of your dead air? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I was. I just want you to. If there's something you'd want to share, something, any, anything about the trial, any any background story. That, that we haven't covered? I know there's a million questions here I haven't. Yeah, um, really for me, I think one of the only other things that I would wanna to touch on is, and you may have asked this ahead of time to let us know, one of the things that has left a lasting impression on this, besides all of the obvious about Maya and the families who were you know, impacted by this type of situation is this trial and this case single-handedly changed the way I take my own children to the doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say four years ago about is when I stopped speaking for my children at all. I go to the doctor, we sit in the exam room, doctor looks me in the eye, asks me a question, and I just turn my face to my children. And I, that's not how I ever acted before as a mother, obviously. Who does that? Um, but because of, you know, the, th the stories that I read with, with Maya and going and sitting through that deposition with Sally Smith and her thinking that someone was faking it, all of this changed the way that I parent from a medical perspective with my kids. Am I going to be believed? Um, you know, are my children going to be believed? And that just hurts my heart and it hurts it for anyone else who ever feels like they have to sort of walk carefully when they're in front of a medical provider. It just breaks my heart. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that, I guess. I just, that, that really impacted me in, in a big way. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. I'll tell you one going on what Katie said, my son, who's now nine, but when he was about four years old, he was helping me mop or something in the kitchen and he slipped and we thought he broke his leg. And I was like, uh oh, uh oh, We're, I'm going to get turned in. I'm going to get turned in. And I was so and I did the same thing, brought him to like a little urgent care pediatric. And I, I was, you know, he couldn't speak that well. But I was like, Grayson, tell them what happened. You know, I, I wanted yeah. it to be out of his own mouth. Because I didn't want to be turned in for child abuse. Oh, you broke your son's leg. I had the same thought. I get it. Yeah. And, you know, my son recently actually was diagnosed with cough variant asthma, which is really similar to Maya. And let me tell you, I don't think I have ever been more stressed in an exam room. It was almost like I had a PTSD reaction to the doctor saying it to me because of everything that Maya went through. And I, it's, it's sort of crazy to me how much this case has really impacted that aspect of my family life and that I, I fear, you know, certain interactions with my doctor, which I never would have before. We had a lot of doctors in our family. My mother was a nurse. I mean, that's never something that ever crossed my mind until this case, if I'm being honest. And so, yeah. Yeah. But uh, thank you for having me on. Katie, Bye. thank Bye. you very I'm much. Sorry I have to thank, you, Katie. <laughs> thank you. Bye, Katie Jane. Bye. Talk later.
Are you two uh, okay with staying just for a minute longer? Or are you? Yes, I, I can. I have a little bit. I don't have a job now, so I can do. I can be here all day. <laughs> oh no, I'm not, right. I'm not letting you go. Twenty-four hour stream. Here we go. Um, Seashell says that that video I have. Oh, I'm gonna mess this up. Try Gemini. Thank you. Try Gemini. You can read it for me. <laughs> try, try, you said, neuralgia. Try I have felt try so Gemini. close to this case, and every in pain every day, and being misunderstood, and not believed. Oh, beautiful ladies, give Maya my love and thank you. <laughs> oh boy, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, uh, Not being believed. I, I just, my, I, like I said, I, I talked to a lot, a lot of families. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I'm going to give a quick shout out to a woman named Beth, who mm -hmm. was instrumental in helping connect me with some of these CRPS parents, um, and then Meg Boland, who we saw testify by Zoom. Um, she runs Ferocious Fighters, and I'm going to give a unapologetic plug to if you guys are looking for a charity to donate to for this holiday season ferocious fighters they help families who are facing a crps diagnosis and they do amazing work uh, all i can think about is being a parent with a mystery illness and then finding out it's that where do you go you go to ferocious fighters so they were they were wonderful but yeah not being believed i heard that story yeah. over and over and over again it's always psychological that's what they always go to and here's the other thing. Here's another thing I learned that, of course, you can't get out in any way in trial. Um, a lot of these people have tried all of the physical therapy programs for CRPS, and they work for a lot of people. Um, but for some of these patients where you have either full body or if it's intractable, they go through this program. And then when they don't succeed or when this program doesn't work for them at various hospitals, um, they get slapped with the label of conversion disorder and psychological issues and then discharged from the program. And what I was told was the reason they do this is because it then doesn't affect their numbers. Then their program looks looks a lot more successful. So just want to put that out there too. Crazy. Uh, Nikki says, uh, can you ask about the CFO's behavior during testimony, reading a script, getting messages, et cetera? Do you, this was one of the last witnesses, I think. Yeah. She was the one that appeared by Zoom. Oh, Dad. yeah, yeah, on the, the Zoom lady. Yeah, that was, uh, I wish Greg had called her out on it. He and I talked about that afterwards, um, but he just didn't, I don't I don't know that he noticed like everyone else did. And I don't know if she just may have been reading notes on her computer. We obviously don't know at this point, um, but it was something that, you know, I noticed. Kelly obviously noticed as well. It's like, she is she reading something? But I can't. And, and the reason why Greg also said he didn't bring it out because um, he noticed a little bit is, you know, the defense counsel has done things that we don't agree with. I'm going to put that nicely. But I can't imagine them stooping to the level of contacting a witness live during trial. I just, that would be just yeah. above and beyond. Speak, speaking of what they shouldn't do in trial, um, Mr. Hunter at one point, um, I think, uh, the judge said that there were materially false um, information that's been presented to the jury. And, and the, as a, as an officer of the court, you have a duty to correct materially false information. And there was a, a little dance that was going on. I don't know. I, I think his back was hurting that day that the witness presented that information. And that's why he said, I didn't hear, hear the testimony. I didn't know what was going on. Um, is, is he in any concern down the road of, of, of getting a, you know, a professional slap on the wrist. I'm going to be careful with this one because um, there is still a pending motion for sanctions that has not been ruled on. Um, right. But yeah, as a officer of the court, you should obviously be truthful in every aspect. All I'll right. Leave it at that. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. I've, uh, I've last, I asked about a third of the questions that that people have. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, a lot of them. <laughs> they, they have a ton. If there's anything you've seen that, that you want to answer, um, now would be the time. Otherwise, I, I was going to say uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you. Thank this, you. This trial has, you know, we, we watch. That's what we do. We watch trials. We love watching lawyers do what lawyers do. And, and this trial had a lot of very good lawyering in it. Um, and, and paralegaling and paralegaling, <laughs> great paralegaling. Um, yeah, we got, hey, by the way, we got introduced as attorney and friends initially. <laughs> like, Scott, you have just made the holidays so much more difficult than they needed to be. <laughs> that will never die. <laughs> um, yeah, you'll get a Christmas card. 
Kim's friends. You're giving me enough thought for Kelly's yes. Christmas present. <laughs> our, our father will be so proud of Jennifer. <laughs> and the other ones. Yeah, and the um, extras. <laughs> no, you guys, uh, it, it was amazing. This trial, um, we've, we've liked a lot of the trials we watched, um, but this trial, um, it, it hit us differently. The, yeah. the facts were, were such that, that, you know, this isn't just a, you know, a run-of-the-mill murder trial, <laughs> which we, we tend to watch. <laughs> Um, and it and it meant a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, a lot of people um, through this, through this coming to light and being shared and, and and brought out this way, have have felt that finally that their side is being told and that they can be understood um, because of what you've done. And, not, and so it's not just for for Maya and her family, mm -hmm. um, but so many other people are. And you'll you'll see it in the chat as as well. We've seen it from all over the world, from people who are saying, yes, you know, it's so hard. This is, this is what I, I deal with every time I try to find, you know, medical care and people tell me it's in my head. And um, so thank you. Thank you from, from all welcome. of them to, to all of you. And uh, obviously you've got a, a couple other people who were part of the team that weren't represented today. They, they create a small role. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, you three ladies uh, made a lot of this happen behind the scenes and, and doing all the work behind there. So thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you you coming on. Is there anything, any parting words you'd like to leave us with? Um, just appreciate your coverage. And my heart goes out to everybody who's going through these kind of similar circumstances. I know that I've personally been getting lots of emails and some phone calls and, um, and it breaks my heart. Um, that we can't personally help you. Um, but I hope that what we did here uh, helps in some way. Yeah. That's my parting thought. Ditto. Wonderful. Ditto. <laughs> well, you, if, you, if you ever think of anything else you'd like to share, um, the door is always open. <laughs> so thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, we, we look forward to, uh, to maybe uh, seeing some future cases that the law firm handles. And <laughs> Lord, I can't do this there. again for a while. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Thank you so Wonderful. much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you guys later. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye. I, I removed myself as well. All right. Uh, Thank you. Thank you all of you for being here. I appreciate that. I'm going to go through and read some of the super chats that uh, that we've missed over over the uh, the time here. So I'm going to see if I can bring those all up. I want to thank all of them. I realized I could not ask all the questions at the, um, and I apologize for that. But let me let me do this here. Okay. Oh, wow. Um, we've, we've got a few. So give me just a second here. Um, let's see, did you tell Anderson and Whitney? That the law, law and lumber chat. Okay, we read that one. Um, it's the absolutely wonderful work for everyone from Mr. Over Torso. Are the plans for general legislation? We read that one. Sorry, I'm, I don't know which ones I read and hit, which ones I haven't. They still don't get it. Thank you very much, Kim R., for that one. Uh, Crazy Cat Queen, we got your, you got your message. I think these are the ones I did do. Mr. Anderson, Mrs. Anderson, and your whole team, thank you so much for taking care of Maya and her family. Thank you. Gerda, I'm, I have to look sideways to read these. I apologize. I'm looking off the screen. Um, Ashley King, who voted to keep juror number one against you? Against uh, you seem torn. Who voted to keep juror number one and against you seem torn? Um, it was uh, it was Jack that actually made the decision to keep him. So that was uh, that was interesting. Uh, Jessica says, "Mrs. Anderson is beautiful." So are you, other ladies? Uh, they're they're sisters. You can see they're 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 related. There, joyful. Thank you very much for the super sticker, Ashley. Were you ever worried with Greg's use of time? I think we covered that one a little bit for that. Uh, Horse Welfare says words cannot express my appreciation to Maya and her coverage for her cover courage, and for acknowledging those who never get justice in an interview. Thank her for me. Uh, can you tell us how Peter Tragos was involved? I know he mentioned he couldn't talk about anything. Um, I don't think I think he knows somebody in the trial. Like he knows attorneys that were involved. Um, that's my understanding. Pre army actually rotated with Dr. Schwartzman, who pioneered ketamine coma treatment, loved his teachings. Thank you, Crazy Cat Queen. Megan says, I'm in Atlantic Beach and I want to come find all three of you and hug you, angels on earth. Uh, that was not for me, that was for the, our guests. So I apologize, Megan, for not showing that while we were here. Uh, great job, team Maya. Bless you all. Did you ever question the storyline or details? Example, the F bombs, Maya's symptoms when Beata wasn't around. I think they uh, they've said that 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 she just tells the truth and that's what it is and so they I don't think they did. 
Uh, we read your message, Seashell. Thank you very much for that one. Uncle uh, says, please let Kyle know he's in our thoughts too. As long as I'm uncle family. Um, Mary Ann says, very remarkable team. Anderson sacrificed financially to represent. Maya had top expert witnesses, yet the defense backed by money had terrible experts. Uh, money can't buy you everything. Uh, thank you for fighting for what's right. I've been following from Scotland. You're all amazing. We'll be following the progress. Thank you very much, Chappers. Uh, Lizzie says, question, Shapiro's wife Facebook post? I still want to know the details on that. I still want to look into that. It was so poignant that they won the day before Polish Independence Day. That was really neat, Laurie. Thanks for sharing that message with us. Um, did Dr. Cochran and the IJ report was never disclosed? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, talked a little bit about the IJ. I still want to know. I still want to see the original, right, that, that never sort of got released. Heather says, have any jurors reached out to you at all? Also, was Mr. Anderson playing us when he almost let go of juror number one? I was screaming at the TV watching defense. Uh, yes, uh, juror number one's with us right now. So, uh, so yes. Um, as a retired social worker, I believe everyone in healthcare must stand up and call out the bad acts done. I'm also a chronic pain patient, and that your awareness brought, meant everything. Becca Lynn, can we get this case and cases like it in front of the U.S. Congress to finally get some oversight and take away the this encompassing, encompassing power hospitals have over their patients? Thank you for all you have done. Thank you, Becca. Uh, Nancy Mammy DeMay says, how long do you think it will take for the monies for them? Thank you for all you did for that family. Um, I, I wasn't going to ask them because obviously there's pending litigation with uh, with the news that Maya is, is pursuing uh, these charges regard, regarding the essay. Um, some of the other lawyers um, that that are following this case, I say other meaning I'm not one, um, but some of the the lawyers that are following this case have, have speculated that this this additional charge might be something that can be used and used as a a method to to get the hospital to settle. And, and to pay out as long as they dismiss this new charge. Um, so that might be something they're doing. And if that happens, it could be a lot quicker than, than if it plays out in slow motion in the appeals process. Any thoughts on the detective interview video? I haven't seen that one. I've heard the audio. Is that what you're talking about? Thank you for all your hard work. One juror's name was accidentally revealed on the court website verdict form. He will probably speak eventually. Uh, yeah, I think the, uh, and, and speaking of, of jurors, there's one right here. A little levity. Thank you, juror number one. I don't know why that bubble appears. I did not do that. That was really cool, but I don't know how it happened or how to make it, <laughs> how to prevent it from happening again. Um, how do Nick and Greg split witnesses? We did answer that one for you. Uh, thank you so much, ladies. So glad justice prevailed. Love the Kowalskis. Um, here's a comment about the bus stop folks for the jurors. Yeah. Wow. Offer my pro bono services to deep dive all boxes of, of Jayco, Aka, and CPS docs for future lawsuits. Not joking. We'll stay mum, of course. Marianne Pont Ponte says, uh, could you tell the story of finding Dr. Cochran, Corcoran? And what was Greg's reaction? I think we're going to talk about that with him directly. Um, I, that's what I think we're going to line that up for later this week. Maybe even tomorrow if he's available on short notice. How does Nick feel about a large amount of the world population having a lawyer crush on him? The obsession is real. Uh, apparently, they're not going to tell him that because it will go to his head. Uh, Maverick and Goose, dream team. This is Megan. Um, who are your favorite witnesses? We talked about that one. Thank you for your great questions, Mathis. Um, Brightfire became a YouTube member. Thank you, Brightfire. Welcome. Let's see. Um, we talked a little bit about that. That was another great question, Mathis. Fun and funky, what did the ladies think about the jazz hands? I think it, personally, it looked like they were celebrating. We had the fists and we had the jazz hands and then we had the, it was, it was what it was. Can't wait to see Dr. Corcoran, Corcoran with his own YouTube channel. He's there. He's got like 4,000 subscribers or 3,000 somewhat subscribers right now. So hopefully we can get him on uh, tomorrow. As a resident with the area, a resident of the area, thank you for showing the broken system and fighting to make it right. All right, you made my eyes sweat, so I'm sending you pet roaches. What? Whiskey. No, no, no. No pet roaches. I have plenty outside. Is Sally Smith a mother? I don't know if she is. Um, what do you think about the witness winking? We talked about that one. That was creepy. Just a little weird. What do they think about the wink guy? Um, yes, yes, we got the guy. Uh, have any other victims of SS contacted the firm for representation? Thanks for being here. 
Well, I think you've got the family that uh, testified uh, during trial, the mom that testified. I think they're they're in a similar situation. How do you all feel about the judge overseeing the case? I think he did a great job. He really did. Um, we talked about the mistrial. That was a great question as well. The appeals process and what's next. Um, only that it's long, Kim. That's all we know. Whatever happened to the witness who was hospitalized? He was a pediatric CA expert. He was wonderful in deposition. Is he okay now? I'm sorry I didn't see that earlier, Ray. I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, Sol Yolo says, I've left RN jobs due to, to J-Hatch type issues. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. A. Nick and uh, your team of heroes, champions and healed my angry heart, exposed evasive God complex doctors and admin. They forgot the oath above all. Do no harm. Kelly May says, Ari, what was the CFO being fed answers? Was she? It seemed to me initially, initially I thought no, but then she started, she was doing a lot of looking off screen at somebody and it looked like there was at least somebody who was communicating in some way with her. I don't know if she was being fed answers, but some of the stuff she would look down on, on the table in front of her, which could have been a, a device of some sort. Uh, the fact that she would sit there and not know the answer for a long time and, uh, and then suddenly have the answer. Um, it seemed to me that somebody was telling her what to say or helping her with, with her understanding. As a family physician, I'm so sorry. That's how you have to interact with your doctor. It makes me feel sad. This is how medicine has become. You got, we asked about that one, Nikki. That's a great question. Um, from Mama, who fought for her babies and somehow made it to the other side, just wanted to say thank you to the wonderful people taking care of Maya. Many blessings. Behind the magic says, did Hunter accuse the judge of, for, of laughing for appeal? I think he'll probably include that in there. Usually in the appeal, they put everything they possibly can into it. Um, KCAT says, I've had RSD, CRPS, for 40 plus years. I was called a drama queen, faker, crazy drug seeker, and it took four years for a diagnosis. A light now shines on what so many have suffered with silently for years. Thank you for giving hope. Um, and then we also had uh, Maggie Carr. Thank you, ladies. Thank you for that, as well as Bug Dugger. I think, I think I got them all. I think I did. Um, at least I got all the super chats. And there's a million questions that were not in super chats that I need to to see if I can read here. New comments. Let me catch up to the bottom. All right. Um, that was that was our interview for today. I'm super super excited. I, I can't thank them enough. The the Morgan sisters, as they call themselves, are are wonderful and obviously uh, provide a huge um, portion of of the workload and and carry the the load in this trial as far as the documents and reading documents and preparing everything. Um, I, this trial couldn't have happened without them, even though they weren't the people up in court making the arguments and questioning the witnesses. Um, so so just a, a huge shout out to to Katie Cat. Katie, Kelly, and uh, and uh, Jennifer, and th and thanks for that. A little miss. Can you please move the emojis from the side of the screen? I don't know if I can. Yeah, I can. Here you go. I just removed them. All right. Uh, that being said, I uh, I think I have the flu. <laughs> it's I hurt so badly. My head hurts. <laughs> My my back hurts. All of me hurts, um, and and I think I'm going to uh, going to crawl back in bed and just shiver. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. So I wanted to say thank you all for being here. I appreciate all of you. This was uh, wonderful. We are going to see if we can get Doctor Corcoran uh, on with us. Um, I'm going to watch and see how he does on on Lawn Lumber tonight. And this actual, this live stream, um, even though it's several hours before Lawn Lumber starts, this live stream is going to portal you over there. The, the reason why is when you get there, there are two things you need to do. You just click the like button on, on Rob's, uh, on Rob's uh, placeholder for his video. And then you ring the bell to say notify me when he goes live. And then you'll be able to follow uh, Dr. Corcoran over there. I'll say that in the, what I've seen from him and what I've talked to him personally, uh, he is a great guy. Uh, just just wonderful. Very, very friendly. Obviously, he did a huge service to help the, the Kowalskis in this trial and did it for free. Um, that's you don't see you don't see that very often. Uh, so I'm looking forward to talking to him as well. I'm looking forward to asking him the questions you have. So if you are you hearing music, I'm not hearing music. 
backwards. Oh, it is there. Okay. All right. Anyway, so if, if you have any questions coming up uh, for him, please let me know. All right. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, I'm, so, I'm like shaking. I'm like, I'm halfway sweating and halfway chilled. I, I need to just crawl into bed. It's going to be, it's early, early nap time for me is what I'm going to do. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate you. Uh, thank you for helping me get through, uh, <laughs> get through an interview when I'm not feeling my best. I apologize for those that I, I was not able to read their questions to. Uh, tonight, when you go home, please hug the people you love. Smile at someone, make their day just a little bit better, and please stay safe till we go live again. It'll be tomorrow morning, uh, bright and early, 8.30 in the morning. Uh, hope you can be there. That would be wonderful. And I'll see if we can get Dr. Corcoran for later this week. I know he's only got this week before he goes out of town, so we're going to catch him for this week. And uh, Gatorade, as many as that. Gatorade, that's the, that's the secret. I think I have some of that in the, in the closet. I've got Mountain Dew that came in the... It came in this in this bag. I guess it came from like 7-Eleven or something. I thought it was like sheets. Anyway, um, yeah, I uh, I tipped the guy. I tipped the guy a lot because I made him drive like an extra 10 miles to get to my house from when he thought where he thought I was. And he apologized to me. He's like, oh, I'm so sorry for that. It's like, no, I gave you the wrong address. It's my fault. So anyway, we're good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my head's fuzzy. <laughs> I'm just going to take the headphones off and go to bed. Thank you all. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a good day. Bye. Because he's the guy. And of course, I'm, I'm on the other thing, so I can't even fade out to my to my logo. So I've got the logo up there. That's That's the best I can do. See you guys.